Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? Today's episode is unusually specific in that it deals with a specific type of cancer known as CLL, which is a type of blood cancer. But it's also universal in that it deals with something we all have in common, which is our mortality. Dr. Kaufman is extraordinary in many ways. First, he's extraordinary in the medical sense in that after 12 years of battling cancer, doctors can no longer find a single trace of malignancy in his entire body. He is 100% cancer-free, going on almost two years, thanks to an experimental therapy that wiped out his cancer conclusively in less than a month. And this is a cancer which is metastatic on day one, which means it had already spread and could be found anywhere and everywhere in his body. But there's another way in which Dr. Kaufman is extraordinary, and that is in how he has handled his diagnosis. The impact that he has had during the last 11 years as the tip of the spear, not only insofar as seeking out and trying the most cutting-edge experimental therapies on himself, but also turning the camera on himself and sharing that experience with the world, first by blogging about it and eventually by leaving his medical practice behind and dedicating his life entirely to being a CLL advocate for cancer patients everywhere. I want to encourage everyone to listen to this episode. Even if it seems irrelevant or inappropriate for you, I can promise you it's not. Some of you already know my own story, that I'm the survivor of a brain tumor that caused me debilitating psychological and physical distress, but which also empowered me to change my life and to make decisions about what was important to me, where I wanted to spend my time, and who I wanted to spend that time with that I don't think I would have made otherwise. I now know that my time in this world is limited. And that's not just true of me. It's true of you. It's true of all of us. We're all mortal. And how we choose to spend our precious time in the face of this reality is what gives our lives their meaning. It's what distinguishes my life from yours and yours from everyone else's. Dr. Kaufman has made his choices, and hopefully he will have many, many more to make. His story is one of perseverance, leadership, generosity, and service to a cause greater than himself. But besides serving as an important source of information and optimism about a very serious illness, I hope that his story and this conversation provide you with cause to reflect on your own life, on the things that matter most to you, and how you want to spend your remaining time on this planet. And with that, please enjoy my very inspirational conversation with Dr. Brian Kaufman. Dr. Brian Kaufman, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm good. It's always great to be back in New York. Are you a regular visitor of New York or the New York area? I'm lucky that I get to come to New York fairly often. There's a lot of the work that I do as a uh, patient advocate and dealing with some of the pharmaceutical industry, doing with patient advocacy organizations brings me to New York pretty often. Hmm. So my 
audience may or may not know this based on the intro that I, I write for this episode, but you were connected to me through a friend who found you because his cousin had fallen ill with CLL. And he told me that I should look into your story, that I, I would find it very interesting. I did. And it opened sort of the door to many things that I think are interesting. And so I, I put together this conversation for us today. But maybe you can start us off with your story and how you got into your current role now as a major advocate for CLL patients. All right. So let's take one giant step back and remind people that CLL stands for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is the most common adult form of leukemia. Having said that it's the most common adult form of leukemia, it doesn't come close to the number of patients with breast cancer or colon cancer or lung cancer or prostate cancer, which is an issue. It's an orphan cancer. So even though it's quite common in the elderly population, the average age of a CLL patient is 72 years old, it's still a relatively rare cancer in that regard. What does orphan cancer mean? So orphan disease is a disease below a certain threshold, a certain number of patients in the US. There's about 22,000 people a year diagnosed mm. with uh, CLL. What about though, from what I understand from my research, CLL also often leads to secondary cancers. Right. So that's a good observation. So chronic means that it's slow growing. Lymphocytic means it's of the lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes are one type of white blood cell. And CLL specifically cancer, the B lymphocytes, which is the type that forms antibodies. And it's a leukemia in that it lives in the blood. Leukemia just means like white blood. But it is also a lymphoma because it comes from the lymphocytes. So like it's a lymphoma like Hodgkin's disease is lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I tell patients that's a good thing because we get the research from both leukemia and lymphoma. We get the research dollars and the interest. So it's we have sort of this double cancer that has two different names. Hmm. So I'd love to walk through the biology here because you throw out a lot of things. Lymphocytes, those exist in the lymph nodes. You mentioned B lymphocytes. These are B cells. There are also T cells. And also the bone marrow plays an important role in this cancer. Can you walk me through the biology of this disease? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it would help if I told a little bit of my own journey sure. and how that, that evolved. So I'm a family doctor. I'm not a hematologist or a oncologist, a cancer doctor. I'm a family doctor, retired family doctor. And 14 years ago, I was, you know, feeling the back of my neck and I noticed some lumps. They were soft, they were mobile. You know, when you think about cancer, you think about hard, fixed lesions that shouldn't feel like they're there. And these just felt like, like a cyst or something. I wasn't terribly worried about them, but they persisted for a few months. So they say that the doctor who treats himself has a fool for a patient, but I went ahead and ordered some blood work on myself. And I remember getting the blood results back and being very pleased. You know, my cholesterol was great. My blood chemistries were all within normal limit but my white blood cells were elevated. So I went on to have a more sophisticated test, which looks at the immunological fingerprint, Im immunophenotyping, which is done by a test called flow cytometry. And it proved that I had a monoclonal population of a particular type of B cell that was consistent with the diagnosis of CLL. And like most family doctors, I didn't know very much about CLL. I knew a little bit. I recently took my board exams for recertification as a family doc, and 1% of the exam is hematology. So you can imagine that most family docs aren't busy studying that. And normally when we have a patient who has hematological malignancy, we're quick to refer that rather than try to handle it ourselves. So I was in that category until I had, you know, pardon the double entendre here, blood in the game, and then suddenly I wanted to become an expert in CLL. So. I quickly learned a lot about CLL when I was first diagnosed. What was that like, the diagnosis? So it comes as a complete shock. So like most people with CLL, nowadays it's most commonly diagnosed when patients are asymptomatic or have very minor symptoms. Like I had some lumps at the back of my neck, which turned out not to be cysts, but lymph nodes. And if you did a more thorough exam, you'd find that I had enlarged lymph nodes where you might expect them in the armpits or the axilla and the groin. I had other lymph nodes that were enlarged in the neck that were harder to feel, but they were definitely there. 
the medical term for that is adenopathy or swollen lymph nodes. So I had this minor symptom and I felt great and I had a very healthy lifestyle. So it was this sort of, you know, how can I have cancer? There must be a mistake here. So there's this sort of denial that this can be really happening because you feel great. Now, this is different than 50 years ago when people were diagnosed with CLL and people weren't running to the doctor all the time and having routine blood work and having well women exams and well man exams and having a complete blood count done on a regular basis. And most people then presented with symptoms. They were tired, they were running fevers, they were losing weight, they're having the symptoms of more advanced and the disease was being diagnosed more advanced. But most people now are diagnosed and they're asymptomatic or have very minor symptoms at the time. Is it similar in a sense to pancreatic cancer where in the case of pancreatic cancer, diagnoses often happen much later because it doesn't present as early or the symptoms. So I think the same thing as the stomach cancer. There are certain cancers that are not diagnosed much later. Is this similar? So the similarities are somewhat limited because pancreatic cancer often when it presents has already spread and it's too late to do much about it. And the same with some gastric cancers, but they can be asymptomatic for a long time. And when you catch it sometimes and often it's too late to do anything. The other piece that's so different about this, and this is a real important point that separates CLL from a lot of other cancers, is there's already this cognitive dissonance that you've been diagnosed with cancer, but you feel great. And you meet with the doc and he says, you've got this chronic lymphocytic leukemia, you've got CLL. It's not curable. There is no cure for it. And so what are we going to do, doc? We're going to do nothing. We're just going to watch it. And you're left saying, are, you know, are you really a doctor? I mean, we've caught this cancer early. It's not causing me any problems. Why don't we jump on it? You would never say to a breast cancer patient, well, your lump is really small. We're not going to worry about it now. Let's wait and see if it grows. No, you get it out. You know, why do we send patients for mammals or pap smears or colonoscopies or skin checks to catch it early and knock it out? Right. But in CLL, we get the diagnosis and the standard care for the vast majority of patients is what's called watch and wait or active observation or what patients call watch and worry because they need to be monitored. So why do we do this? And this gets into the biology of the disease. The first word in CLL is chronic because a significant percentage of patients never need treatment. They have the same life expectancy as someone without chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Then that's not the majority. The majority will need treatment and the disease will progress. But why would you treat 15, 20% of patients who would never need to be exposed to potentially toxic medications if they're going to have a normal life expectancy and their disease will never need treatment. Mm. The other piece of that is that there's no evidence that early intervention makes people live any longer, which is entirely different. If you look at a woman with stage one breast cancer versus stage four breast cancer, there's a huge survival advantage to catching it early. Is that because there isn't a particular location of the malignant tumor or the malignancy? It's already spread because it's a blood-based cancer? Absolutely. So, you know, all blood case cancers are metastatic on day one. They've spread throughout the whole body. So CLL, you know, when it's found, it's in the blood, it's found in the lymph nodes, it's found all over the place. So it's it's already spread. That's one issue that's there. But the other issue is that there's, again, no evidence that intervening early makes a difference. The therapies that we have now seem to be equally efficacious, whether you start them on the day one or you start them when, uh-oh, you're getting anemic, uh-oh, you're having symptoms, let's start the therapy now. It seems often to the advantage to wait until you need treatment because none of these treatments are free of their toxicities. So waiting and give the patient a long time to wait. And if the patient is most of that time asymptomatic and just waiting till they become symptomatic, that's when you start to intervene. This also grows out of the history of CLL because in the old treatments we have in the old days were just you know a little over a decade ago, the only treatments we had were chemotherapy. And if you'd get a chemo and then the clock would start ticking and that chemo for most patients would stop working after a few years, maybe five years, some people were lucky and had longer. And then you'd get a second chemo and that would work for less time 
and then you didn't have a third option. So you wouldn't want to start that clock ticking until you absolutely had to because you had limited options. Things are different now and patients are doing better. So this whole idea of active observation or watch and wait is being re-examined. But for right now, there's this weirdness that you get this diagnosis, you're not expecting to have cancer, and then you're told by your doctor, and we're not gonna do anything for it. So when you're saying the therapies we have now, you're talking about the standard of care, which is chemo and bone marrow transplants. You're not including some of these new targeted or immunotherapies. So the treatments we have now for CLL are radically evolved. I mean, the therapeutic landscape has changed radically in CLL. And so what treatments we have now have changed how we should be approaching this disease. So when I was diagnosed 14 years ago, there was nothing that was shown to prolong life, let alone cure CLL. There was nothing shown to add any, any therapy that I had could get me into remission perhaps. But when the disease came back, it would come back more aggressive and my total lifespan would be the same as if I hadn't had that treatment. Was that even the case for, let's say, successful bone marrow transplants, let's say where you had a, a biological twin? Were there cases where you could be cured in the past? So in the past, and still maybe in the present, though there's some controversy about this that we can get into, the only proven curative therapy is a bone marrow transplant. So if you think of CLL, CLL is a cancer of the B cells, of the lymphocytes, and that's part of the immune system. So you have this corrupt immune system. And the immune system, and I'm going to talk about this in my own personal story, is not good at attacking itself. The immune system is not working well. So the only potentially curative way until quite recently was to throw out that immune system and import a new, like if you have corrupt police force, you don't ask them to monitor themselves. You bring in an outside authority, a different police force, and you throw out the old police force. So that's what a bone marrow transplant is. You get it from someone else. They look in and say, that doesn't look right over there. That looks like a cancer cell. That looks like a problem. And it attacks and wipes out the cancer. The problem is you can get what's called graft versus host disease. So you get the graft versus leukemia, which is desirable, which is a potent immune response. And it's durable because these new cells are become your new B cells. Somebody else's B cells become your B cells. But it can also attack your gut, your liver, your eyes, and that's called graft versus host and disease. And that's, that's a situation where this new immune system that you imported doesn't recognize the body and views the entire host as a foreign agent that it right. needs to attack. The graft versus the host. And that can right. kill you, basically. That can kill you, and if it doesn't kill you, it can make you miserable. When you talk to transplanters, they talk about different groups of people. There's the miracles, the people who are, you know, had two feet and one arm in the grave that get pulled back with a transplant. And then there's the tragedies where people die of treatment-related mortality or it just doesn't work and the disease comes back. But there's patients who say, this wasn't the deal that I asked for. They may have their disease knocked back, but the graft versus host is so horrific that you know and they're on so much immunosuppressive meds, those immunosuppressive meds can lead to infections and to other complications. Because they have to suppress their immune system. From attacking themselves. Or they're just miserable with skin problems, with GI problems, not being able to eat, with liver inflammation. Yeah, there's no way to walk that back once you do the transplant? Once it's in, it, you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's there. So CAR T therapy, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, grew out of this saying, you know, we know what works. Cellular therapies work because they're durable. The cells stand around. They chase down every little bit of cancer. But is there a way to get to this without having graft versus host disease? Hmm. So we can talk about that. So when I was diagnosed 14 years ago, so I looked around and there was no evidence that anything would be helpful. And transplants have a significant treatment related mortality TRM, you know, about 15, 20% of people die in the few months after a transplant. So it wasn't something I was going to rush into, but my disease progressed and mine behaved more like a lymphoma. I had to grow a big Santa Claus. Now, over what period in time you were diagnosed in 2005? When in 2005 were you diagnosed? In September of 2005. September of 2005, right. a date I'm sure you don't forget. In right. fact, I think you've talked about it in terms of a paradigm shift. Right. So 
I was diagnosed just a few weeks before my oldest daughter's wedding and um, Ashkenazi Jewish, which by the way is CLL is more common in Ashkenazi Jews. And there's a teaching in the Talmud, which is a commentary on the, the Hebrew Bible that says when a funeral and a wedding come to the same corner at the same time, the wedding takes precedent. You choose life over death. Hmm. And so it was very difficult for my wife and I, because I'd gotten this horrible diagnosis and it was just a couple of weeks before this huge celebration. So all the kids are coming back from college, all the families flying in, people are flying in from all over the world for my daughter's wedding. And I couldn't say a word, couldn't say a word to my kids, couldn't say anything until the wedding was That's over. That's hard, you didn't tell your family. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't wanna spoil their honeymoon. I don't wanna spoil what's going on, you know? So we waited till the wedding was over because we wanted the joy of that occasion to be what people mm -hmm. remembered. And I'm still around 14 years later and my daughter is giving me granddaughters. You have so two kids? I have four kids. Four have, kids. Yeah, two girls, two boys. So we're really blessed that way. So we kept it quiet. And again, because I was relatively asymptomatic, there was really nothing to do. My lymph nodes kept growing and I had to grow kind of a big Santa Claus beard to hide the lymph nodes in my neck. My patients could kind of notice them. You know, they were saying to me, Dr. Kaufman, are you okay? What's going on? My blood counts got a little bit worse, but not too bad, but my spleen enlarged and I got full easily and I had some GI issues and stuff. And this progressed over what period of time? A couple years. A couple of years. Yeah. It was a steady progression. Steady, slow progression. But then one day I noticed some little red dots on my legs. And I was worried these are broken blood vessels called petechiae, which are like tiny little bruises, which can be from inflammation of the blood vessels called vasculitis or problems in the clotting system. So again, like I said, the doctor who treats himself as a fool for a patient, I ordered a complete blood count on myself. And I was on call that night and I remember this very well. I got a call at about 2 a.m. in the morning and I said, Dr. Kaufman, I said, yes. He said, we have a critical lab level on Dr. Kaufman and my platelet count, and the platelets are what helps your body clot, should be over 150,000, and mine were nine. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, that's crazy. the lowest number I've ever heard of. Mine have been lower. I mean, sometimes they've been six and four, and wow. sometimes not measurable. This is not compatible with a happy life. I mean, when we're driving to the hospital, I realize if I get into a little tiny fender bender, I could internally bleed hemorrhage death, and bleed yeah. to death. And that led to multiple hospitalizations, in all kinds of treatments, high dose steroids and IV infusions and nothing seemed to work for me. I had an emergency splenectomy because the spleen filters out the platelets. That didn't work. I bled internally and my hemoglobin, which was about 14 grams, which is normal, dropped to seven grams in 24 hours. My belly swelled up because I was bleeding internally. I, was, I looked like I was six months pregnant, except I was black and blue from all this internal bleeding from the, the surgery. I mean, it was touching. There was a lot of nights that I went to bed when I didn't know whether I'd wake up in the morning. So I had this really bad autoimmune complication of CLL called ITP or immune thrombocytic venic purpura. So not only is my cancer leading to immune deficiency, it's leading to my, my immune system acting out and attacking my platelets. It's a rare complication of CLL, one to 2% of CLL patients get it but I was unlucky and got it and it led to my platelets crashing. So as I understand the biology or as I thought I understood it, the negative impact on the platelet count for CLL patients is a derivative of the fact that you have an explosion of the growth of B cells. It crowds out blood cells and platelets. Is that accurate? Or That's accurate for some patients. So there are many causes for low counts whether it's the hemoglobin, the red blood cells, or the platelets, or the neutrophils, a different kind of white blood cell. The most common is the blood, bone marrow is the factory floor, as you suggested. And if the bone marrow is 90% full of CLL, the body expands, it starts building red blood cells and white blood cells and other parts of the bone marrow that it normally wouldn't do in adults, and it compensates, but at some point it can't compensate anymore. And that leads to gradual increases, and there is kind of a tipping point. But a more sinister and rare cause of those low platelets or low hemoglobin, in my case, the platelets, mm. 
is that the body attacks itself. And that's an autoimmune complication of CLL. Now that same ITP, immune thrombocytic penic purpura, or low platelets from an immune cause, can happen outside of CLL, but it happens more commonly in CLL. And that tends to lead to a more precipitous fall of the platelets, a more life-threatening kind of fall. And that's what I had. I had this ITP that was very, very difficult to control. So I was getting multiple treatments for that ITP, and we finally came across a combination of two drugs that seemed to work for it. One was an antibody. It's an immune therapy called rituximab. So on the surface of CLL cells, there are- Malignant B cells, correct? Right, right. Can you tell our, our listeners what B cells traditionally are supposed to do, what part they take in the immune system? So. Our immune system is complicated and there's all kinds of parts to it, but one part is the lymphocytes. And the lymphocytes are really divided into three categories, the B cells, the T cells, and the natural killer cells. Most people have heard of T cells. That's right. like the killer cell, that's the sort of soldier of the immune system. And it's the cellular therapy, and we're gonna spend a lot of time on that when we talk about CAR T. But the B cells are the humoral, which comes from the Greek humors, the mm. four humors, and it's the liquid part of the immune system. So what they do is they make antibodies. So when you get a flu shot or if you were a kid and got a measles shot, you formed antibodies and those were formed by B cells that matured into what are called plasma cells and formed these antibodies. So the normal B cells form antibodies. CLL is a cancer of the B cells and they're dysfunctional and they can crowd out the normal B cells, they can crowd out the they're T cells. They're like scouts, they scout the body and they tag let's say foreign or pathological agents that the T cells then attack, is that a? Well, they get messages to say, there's antigens or just proteins hmm. that they get presented and say, hey, here's a problem, let's see what we can do. And it's all part of a coordinated system hmm. with the T cells and B cells. There's all kinds of redundancies built in so we can live without B cells. I don't have B cells, hmm. cancerous or non-cancerous when you get- We're gonna get to, into that when we talk yeah, about CAR T. Right. So. The B cells form antibodies. So like, for example, I don't get a flu shot anymore because I don't form any antibodies. Hmm. It wouldn't do me any good. So that's the role of the normal B cells. What happened with me is my immune system not only became non-functional, it became dysfunctional and started attacking my own cells. And in my case, my platelets. Other people, it attacks their red blood cells, mine had attacked my platelets. And we tried to turn it off. We tried to turn it off by using an antibody that would kill some B cells. And this same antibody is used to treat autoimmune problems like rheumatoid arthritis by calming down the immune system. I had another drug called cyclosporin, which suppresses T cells. And it's most commonly used when people have like kidney transplant. So the body won't reject the foreign kidney. It knocks down the T cells. And this combination of rituximab and cyclosporin worked and seemed to calm down my ITP. And when I had a bone marrow biopsy done, my CLL had gone from 90% of my bone marrow down to about 6% of my bone marrow. This was unexpected. And though rituximab has some activity against CLL, it's usually pretty weak. It doesn't usually have great effect in the bone marrow. And cyclosporin, there's been some papers, some anecdotal cases of cyclosporin having anti-CLL activity, but generally it was not used to treat CLL. So suddenly I was in this significant remission and I'd almost died. So in 2007, 2008? Yes, yeah, about then. I was in this significant remission. So what to do at this point? So I took a radical approach and what you're gonna find out from me is I'm an early adopter of things is we started this conversation, the only known curative therapy was a transplant. So I'm 57 at this point, you know, and I'm thinking there are no therapies particularly gonna be helpful for me. You never considered chemotherapy seriously? And so CLL is an extraordinarily heterogeneous or variable disease. So there's that 15, 20, 25% who never need treatment. And then there's some who have a very aggressive disease. And while we can't predict for individuals, we can predict for groups. And I was in the group that was a very high risk group. So I had these prognostic and predictive factors that look at the inside the cell and see what chromosome abnormalities I had. 
And I was missing certain chromosomes. I was missing the long arm of the 11th chromosome, that's an 11Q, the short arm of the 17th chromosome, 17P. These are very bad prognostic markers. I also later had next generation sequencing, which showed that I had mutations in certain things, certain kind of oncogenes were mutated. I didn't have the apparatus to turn my cells off. The way that chemo works is by damaging the DNA the same way the radiation works. So then the cell gets a signal, my DNA is damaged. They have something called TP53, which is a protein, which goes in and tries to fix that. And if it can't fix it, turns on the cell suicide, program cell death. If that chromosome lives on the short arm of the 17th chromosome, if you're missing the 17th chromosome, you're list missing that ability, which means chemo won't work. Or if you have the short arm, of the 17th chromosome, but that TP53 protein is mutated, chemo won't work. And that was my circumstance. So there was really no role for chemo with me. I also had something else, which is another predictive factor called unmutated IGVH, which is a marker which suggests that chemo was less likely to give me any durable response. So I was in this circumstance where the best I could hope for would be a couple of years of chemo and likely that would be optimistic. So that's why I moved. When I got into this remission, I went for a transplant hmm. up front. This is very unusual because usually transplant, because of the treatment related mortalities associated with it, was seen as kind of a Hail Mary pass, kind of a last stitch effort. So why is Brian doing this up front? Well, because I didn't have a lot of other options. I just kind of did a logical kind of assessment of what's going on. I said, if I don't do anything, if I do chemo, if I follow the regular path, if I looked at the survival curves based on the data at that time, it's entirely different now. So I'm anxious to get to that part, but at the data at that time, my chances of being alive in about five years were about 5%. About 5% of people like me were alive mm. in five years, one out of 20. With a transplant, even though I had maybe a 15, 20% chance of dying in the next three to six months, where if I didn't have a transplant, my chance of dying in the next three to six months was probably one or 2%. My chances of being alive in five years from now was about 50, 50. And my chances of being cured were just a little bit less than that. So it seemed to me like a no brainer decision. And you couldn't just wait. It didn't make any sense to wait and not do chemo because you had such a great response to the other drug. Yes, I had a great response to the other drug. First, chemo wouldn't work if I waited right, or didn't sure, wait. Sure, sure, sure. And at this time, so this is about 12 years ago, there was no even twinkle in the eyes of researchers about any new kinds of therapies coming. There was no CAR T therapy. There was none of these small molecules that have revolutionized the care of CLL. So I really didn't have a lot of options. You hadn't heard of a Brutinib at the time. Nobody had, had heard of ibrutinib at even... that point. I spoke to the researcher who actually developed the molecule and the molecule was just being made at this time. It wasn't in any human trials at this point. Mm. You know. So you decided to roll the dice on a transplant? I rolled the dice on the transplant this because the odds- This was I think 2008, I think is right, yeah, yeah. So you decided to roll the dice and what happened? So what's interesting, and you brought up the issue of chemo because most people who had transplants had had chemo before. The chemo is toxic to any fast growing cells, including bone marrow cells, and it damages your T cells, which are the cellular part, like you talked about, the soldiers and the captains of the immune system. I'd never had chemo. So ironically, even though my immune system was corrupt and inadequate, it was adequate enough for me to reject the graft because I hadn't been beaten up before with chemo. So I got the graft, it started to do a little work, but within months, I ended up rejecting the graft and never becoming the other person. I lost the graft and went back to being myself again. When you have a, a transplant like that, do they put you on immunosuppressants? Do they try and suppress your immune system in order yes. to help you take the graft? So there's all different kinds of transplants. So the first thing in CLL, the only ones that have been shown to work are what are called allogeneic, which means from someone else, because you need the graft versus leukemia response. If you take it from your own cells, an autologous transplant, where you use your own cells, those don't work. But the kind of transplant I got, 
thank God, was called the reduced intensity or mini transplant, some people call this. And what they do is they give me just enough chemo, not to knock back the CLL, but to clean out my bone marrow a little bit and knock mm -hmm. down my immune system so I won't immediately reject the graft. So the graft goes in and then they give me all kinds of immune suppressive drugs to keep the graft. And you stay on those depending on what's going on for months and months. And if you get graft versus host, sometimes they push those up. And those can be things like I mentioned before, cyclosporin, but also steroids and tacrolimus and serolimus. There's all kinds of different drugs that they give you so you won't lose the graft. But that didn't work for me. And I ended up rejecting the graft within a few months. My CLL started to come back. Even though I got a nice response, it came back pretty quickly. My ITP, my little platelets all came back. But it bought me some time. It was like I'd reset the clock and I had a few years, you know, of just the CLL slowly coming back and the ITP slowly coming back, but not single digit platelets. How are you doing emotionally during this time? Because you're also talking about a time where there really wasn't anything on the horizon. Like you said, right. you hadn't, you weren't sort of in this phase where a lot of people are today, which is they're hopping from one therapy to the next with the hope that they can eventually ride one comet out. Right. How are you doing? So when you get the news that you've relapsed after a transplant, it's pretty depressing. But you sort of have to keep your eye on the ball and try to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? How do I get to the next step? And you just sort of try to move forward. One of the things I do as a physician is try to be very zen about this and kind of detach. I tell patients, you really have to underreact because you're going to get good news during the journey and you're going to get bad news. And you just got to kind of underreact and keep going. And I try to, I sort of turn on the nerdy side of myself and become analytic and say, what would I do with a patient like this? And try to be self analytic without getting too emotional. Sometimes I'm good at it and sometimes I'm not so good at it. But I just try to sort of, step away from it and look at how do I move forward? And it's not like you have a choice. Like people say, well, you're so brave to do this. That's completely bogus. Does that part being sort of level-headed, learning to underreact, does that actually get easier with time because you're kind of in it? It can get easier with time and it can be difficult sometimes to turn off because then you're you can get emotionally detached from things you should be emotionally attached to, mm. you know? I mean, you sort of develop this Teflon coating, but can you turn it off and on, you know? It also becomes hard to be, are you suggesting that it gets hard to sort of imagine that they get very hopeful because you're trying to keep your expectations low? Right, because you want your hope to be grounded in reality and look like anybody, you know, I'm You don't want to have your heart broken. Yeah, you don't have your heart broken, but you're also trying to be optimistic about things and, and look forward and be upbeat, but you've just kind of be realistic. Like any cancer patient, anytime you get a scan or a blood test, you know, your heart's in your hand until you get those results back and you know things are stable. You know, you're waiting for that. What did my CT show? Did anything come back? What did my blood count show? Is the count still stable? This is the way it is. So no matter how cool I try to be, it was never, you know, all that cool. But you don't have a choice. Like, I mean, it's not like, People say to you, well, what did you want to do? Well, you must have been so brave to, it's not like I'm brave. It's like, what could I do? Like, I mean, a transplant seemed like a logical thing and the transplant didn't work. And I thought about a second transplant and I thought about some other things that I just thought about, okay, this didn't work. What's my next move? Like, I mean, it was my way of coping was being analytic and trying to figure out what's the next thing I do. How soon after your initial diagnosis did you reach a point of acceptance? <laughs> I don't know that you ever reach a point of acceptance. There's always, it's just something that you deal with. I mean, one of my favorite quotes is Gilda Radner said, if it wasn't for the downside, everyone would want cancer. And it's kind of true. Like, I mean, if cancer wasn't life threatening, I mean, the world that I live in, like I'm, I'm here in New York City talking with you, Dimitri, I get to 
travel around the world and talk about my story and my journey. My world is much bigger, it's more exciting. I move with really interesting scientists. I get to do really exciting research. I live in this much bigger world. But you're also more appreciative, right? I think that's right. what Radner was suggesting as well, I imagine. Right, so the other piece is, and this is something that I know well, and if I can say so, I think you know too, is that I've gone to bed at night not knowing whether I'm gonna wake up in the morning. All of us know our time here is limited, but none of us believe it until we get cancer. And then when you have cancer, you realize, oh, this is for real. You know, nobody gets out of here alive. It's not just theoretical. Right, yes, we all are going to die. And in our case, it could be tomorrow. It could be, I don't get off the operating table. It could be my platelets don't go up again. It could be I could have a major hemorrhage during the night. You know, I remember if I bumped my head lightly, you know, you know, it would be like, oh my God, is that gonna lead to a, a major bleed? So everybody says, don't sweat the small stuff. But when you have cancer, it's all small stuff in comparison. So what really matters to me, it's your family, it's the good works that you do, it's the advocacy stuff that you can be doing to move things forward. I mean, what really counts and what can you drop away that no longer matters? So I watched a very moving presentation by your wife it was actually during a lecture that you were giving. You brought her in and she presented your son's comic strip, mm -hmm. which is actually beautiful. I found it very moving. And I, I was trying to understand kind of why I felt that way. And I think it, his love for you came out in the detail of that comic. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was fun. And, and my wife- and Your and wife's narration also, her love it. for yeah, you yeah. came out in that. And so that's a way of asking really, what was the family dynamic during this time for you? How was your family coping with this and how were you working with them through this difficult time? So it takes a family to get through this and you cannot do this on your own. Let me um, give you an example of this that I can from the CAR-T. It's kind of jumping ahead in the story, but when I had the CAR-T therapy, it's done on an outpatient basis. Maybe this would be a good opportunity to tell. We'll, we'll jump around, but maybe uh, you can tell them what CAR-T therapy is. So CAR-T stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. So this is a new angle, cellular therapy. So CAR-T therapy is a living drug. It's a biologic. So what they do is they take the T cells, which we talked about earlier, they take them out of you through a process. It's like a fancy centrifuge called the leukophoresis machine and they spin off the T cells and they purify them. Then they infect them with a lentivirus. That means like a slow virus. This is a cousin to an HIV virus, okay? This is fooling around with your genes and it's inserting new genes in there. It's inserting new genes to take these lazy T cells that aren't doing a good job of fighting the cancer and turn them into serial killers. Well, this is an evolution of the innovation in bone marrow transplants, right? It's not a direct lineage, but in terms of the fact that both are an attempt to turn your immune system against the cancer. Right, so cancer is very good at hiding from the immune system and turning off the immune system. And what the CAR-T does is skip some steps so the T cells don't have to recognize the cancer, they're taught to recognize the cancer. Is it kind of like born. teaching a dog to sniff out cocaine or bombs or something like that? They get the scent and then they're put back into the body and they know where to find the cancer and, that's, and to attack that's it? That's a very good analogy, except the difference here would be is that they, they keep going. They're serial killers. Hmm. They see a cancer cell and they do another. So they grow these cells outside of you. There's all kinds of purity and sterility checks and stuff like that. And these cells, and they get a certain count, certain number of millions of these cells that have been trained to attack the cancer. It's remarkable. For, yeah. It's gene therapy. And one, I'm in a clinical trial for this. This is not approved in CLL at this point. And the FDA demands that I be followed for 15 years because, you know, we don't know for certain where all the new DNA was inserted, you know, into my genome. I mean, I'm part mouse now. You know, I have these mouse genes. Can you explain in me. that? Uh, yeah. I don't really understand that. So I, I understand that they've taken T cells out of your body, they've modified them so that they can attack the cancer. Mm -hmm. 
but I'm not clear exactly on how that's risky in any way, in the way that you're describing. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So when they take the genetic material, so there's my T cells that are outside of me, and they try to purify it so it's only T cells, but there might be a couple B cells and natural killer cells and other cells in there. And then they put the virus in and the virus inserts something to recognize a marker on the surface of the cancer cell. It also is on the surface of normal B cells and we'll go into that later. Now, it puts it in, but they don't have control over, does it put one copy in, five copies in? Where does it put the copy in? Maybe it splits it in a spot that turns some gene on. Maybe that's what's called an oncogene or a cancer gene. There's been tragedies before in gene therapy where perhaps we're turning something into a cancer. So, you know, it's tough to fool around with mother nature. And when you start fiddling with the genetic code- In other words, you don't... could create cancer in the lab and be inserting it into the body. That's correct. That hasn't happened. And there's all kinds of safeguards against it. And also they want to make sure that there's no virus left. So it's not still doing it. And it's only in these T cells. It's not anywhere else. And it's only attacking this particular thing. But things can go wrong and things can get out of control and there can be unintended consequences. So that's why they want to follow me because they've manipulated my genes, not all my genes, just the genes in my T cell. So if you took a cheek swab from me, you know, my cheek genes would be the same. If you looked at my DNA in you know a biopsy of my skin, it wouldn't show. So it. these new T cells that they insert in you, they begin to replicate and they replace the existing T cells in your body. Well, I have T cells left in me, but what happens is, so they grow these outside of you. Then you get what's called lymphodepleting chemo. So just like with the model that we talked about with a transplant, we need some chemotherapy to prevent me from rejecting these new T cells, even though they're my T cells, they've been genetically modified. So I might see them as a stranger and my body reject them. So this makes room for them. They go inside you and it's very disappointing. You're getting this thing that you've been waiting for forever. And you get this little infusion over 10 or 15 minutes and nothing happens, nothing. You know, and they just are dormant. They just sleep there for a while. And I was blogging about this and reporting about this. I remember saying, wish me ill, because you want to get this inflammatory response where the T cells start expanding and get into a killing frenzy. Why do they initially remain dormant? I don't know the answer to that okay. for sure. They so can be said- dormant for a couple of days or sometimes a couple of weeks, but usually in five to 10 days, they kind of wake up and start attacking. So you, you wrote on your blog, wish me ill, because you wanted these T cells to wake up and to begin to attack the cancer. Right. And when they attack the cancer, there's a killing frenzy that goes on and there's all kinds of toxic things that can happen. The contents of the cancer cells can spill out and cause kidney problems and other things, but the body reacts with inflammation. And so you can feel flu-like. So where I had it done, which was the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, the Fred Hutchison or the Hutch in Seattle, it's done on an outpatient basis. And I developed these flu-like symptoms and my wife had this very clear protocol about what she was supposed to do, take his temperature, ask these questions, do these things. And I met certain criteria. So she called and said, the doctor on call said, bring him in a hospital. And I was hospitalized for about four or five days. And I felt flu-like, achy, pretty bad, like a horrible flu. So now you, you got the infusion in Seattle, but you went back home. No, no, no. I When I say I went back home, I went back to the hotel that we oh, were staying in. They you, don't, were staying, yeah, you were staying they, near the hospital. Yeah. That, you're not allowed to be more got than it. 20 minutes from the hospital, which in Seattle is about one block with the traffic. Got it. You know, it's pretty bad. We were staying in like an extended care hotel, you know, for sure. two months, you know. I mean, this is a, obviously a huge commitment. We're talking about this and I want to capture as much of the biology as possible. And we're really, I think, selling short the emotional toll that this has taken throughout the course of the, these years that we're right. talking about here. But continue, please. So when these car T's wake up, they start killing and they lead to release of inflammatory molecules that are called cytokines. It's called the cytokine release syndrome. The old- CRS. CRS. The old non-PC name for this was a cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to say that anymore. And so I went through this. I got better. 
just on my own, nothing real bad. And then went back to the hotel. And about five or six days later, I was getting achy and sore and really in a lot of pain and having trouble moving. And it kind of migrated around my body. And I remember- You were expecting something like this. Well, I thought I was through it. I'd had been in hospital for five days and this is about four or five days later. Were you worried that your response wasn't strong enough? Well, there's you no- wanted, Like you said, you wanted to feel that you got ill. Yeah, so important question. The data is scant on this. There's not many people who've had it, but the data seems to suggest that what's important is that you have some kind of reaction. Oh. But the depth of the reaction doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. What matters is how much the cells expanded, how durable they are may be a factor, but it was mainly how much those cells expanded. So some people have done very well with just minor aches and pains. Other people have had terrible CRS, cytokine release syndrome, and not done well at all. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Is there any way to predict the extent of the response based on the proliferation of the cancer? Is there any way, in other words, to get a sense of how much cancer is in your body so that you can prepare yourself for the type of response that you're gonna experience? Well, there's algorithms that can look at the number of lymph nodes you have and their size and summate that and look at what your white blood cell canta is and they can do that. And there's some suggestion that the more disease you have, the stronger the reaction is. But it's still a lot of hit and miss. Some people with tremendous burdens of disease have had very mild reactions. And other people with very little disease have had very severe reactions. It's very much in its infancy. And there's more unknowns than there are knowns. What happened with me has only been described in one other person. And after I gone through this cytokine release syndrome, clearly done that. I was back and feeling better. And then about four or five days later, I got these aches and pains, which progressively got worse. And I remember I had to go to the bathroom. I needed to sit down on the toilet. And I was standing in front of the toilet for 20 minutes because I couldn't move. I couldn't sit. And my wife said, this isn't normal. I said, you know, I mean, this is the kind of denial I'm in and I'm kind of out of it. I'm saying, well, no, no, honey, it's normal for me to take 20 minutes to sit down on the toilet. I just had no idea how out of it I was and what was going on. So to her credit, she ignored my advice saying, don't call the docs, I'm gonna be okay. You know, cause I don't know what's going on. You're experiencing neurotoxicity. I'm um, neurotoxicity or what now called neural events is like, they like us to use that language. There was a cognitive decline going on. Right, I was toxic. I didn't know what was the going on. The cytokines in your blood were causing the toxicity. And there may be some brain swelling and some inflammation that's yeah, different right. because there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between the cytokine release syndrome and the neuro events. But my wife called and I ended up going to hospital and then I was really sick this time. I mean, I couldn't move. I was in excruciating pain. When the sheets hit my legs, I was screaming in pain. I had massive edema. I looked like swelling of the legs. I looked like the Michelin man. My joints were red hot. They put a needle in, they aspirated my knee to see what was going on. I had all kinds of inflammatory white blood cells that consistent with like a septic joint. They put me on antibiotics while they're trying to figure out what's going on. Nothing grew out. And they never quite figured out, but they figured out it could be some kind of inflammatory reaction that was triggered by this. I couldn't move. My inflammatory markers were tens of thousands times what they should be. They were incredibly high. My CAR T cells had massively expanded. I was really sick. I was in excruciating pain. I was on Dilaudid, which is a heavy opioid around the clock. I was hallucinating. You remember, you remember this? I remember some of this. Some of this is from what my wife and daughter who came up to relieve her were telling me, but I was hallucinating. I'd been up to the Olympic Peninsula. I was in the forest. I was talking to monks in caves. I was in this museum being interviewed. The doctors would come in and talk to me and I'd say, leave me alone, I'm being interviewed in a museum. I, I was completely out of it. And you remember some of these hallucinations? Yeah, I remember them because, you know, sometimes I think it's important to know what your subconscious is saying to you. My son really sure, encouraged me. Sure, I agree me, with that. Yeah, to say, dad, you know, write some the, of this down son, so you're your son, The same son who created the it's, comic? No, the different son. Oh, yeah, you, so you've got son. very creative children, yeah, artistically so, inclined yeah, children. Yeah, so yeah, he did the videos and stuff. That's all my, my other son, Ben. And William did the, uh, the, what the drawings. What a great family you have. Yeah, I'm really blessed. I'm so blessed. So I try to remember, but I had a conversation with one of my docs and 
he called me like a week later and said, did you talk to anybody last week? And I said, no, I didn't talk to anyone. And I'd had a 45 minute conversation <laughs> with him. And my daughter said she had to call him back and said, you know, Dr. Bird, please excuse Brian. He doesn't know what's going on. And I wrote a blog post and it's complete gobbledygook. It's like Alice in Wonderland stuff, but I had no idea. When you're out of it, you don't know that you're out of it. You know, I mean, you don't know how far gone you are and you're in also being a physician. And I might say at the risk of, being a gender insensitive, being a male physician, I was kind of in denial about all this stuff. Well, I can handle all this. This is pretty normal. But I was completely out of, so my wife had to take control. I was very sick. I was lying, so I got a blood clot in my lung, what's called a pulmonary embolus. I was really sick. What caused the blood clot? Well, so blood clots happen when you're immobile. I couldn't move. Okay. I could not move. I could not lift my leg off the bed. I had to be catheterized. Were you ventilated at some No, stage? no, no. So I never was in the ICU. Mm -hmm. My blood pressure stayed stable. I could talk and breathe, you know, but I couldn't get up. I mean, they had to use a special harness. So you're three basically people. on death's door in this process. Well, I'm not on death's door, but I'm not doing well. And mm -hmm. my daughter, and who's an architect, well, my oldest daughter, my wife talking, are we going to have to revamp the house because daddy can't walk anymore? I had to get around in a wheelchair. I couldn't move. It took three people to get me into a chair or if I had to go to the bathroom, it took people to stand me up to urinate. I mean, it was- How many days was this going on? This went for about four days and I was on dilated around the clock. And they finally said, let's see what's going on. Let's see if we can reverse this. And they gave me some anti-inflammatory medications, a steroid called dexamethasone, and then something that blocks interleukin-6 called tocilizumab, which is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and other diseases, and then more dexamethasone. Anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories. And the swelling and the pain melted away. And I didn't need anything. I mean, just something like an Advil strength kind of stuff afterwards from being on wow. dilaudid. In fact, it got better so quickly that I went through opioid withdrawal because they stopped the opioids oh, and wow. I've been getting them. And I remember I was getting shaky and goosebumps and anxious. And my daughter said, dad, it looks like you're going through some kind of withdrawal or something. Cause I was like really shaky. And they gave me some IV Valium and I woke up six or eight hours later and felt better. But I had to learn how to walk again. I had to use a walker and I had the belt around me like you see in older people. Now when people. you say you had to learn how to walk again, what do you mean you had to learn it? Was it well, I couldn't walk. I didn't have the strength. I had pain in my legs. You know, I hadn't walked for days and I couldn't walk normally. I didn't have the balance. I was still, from the I was physical way better. exhaustion. It wasn't. Or a from the inflammation that had happened in my joints. Uh -huh. I mean, we don't really fully understand it, but I couldn't fully bend my legs. I was okay. exhausted. But it my, wasn't a neurological thing. It's not fully understood, but it's probably more of an arthritic thing, mm -hmm. but it's not fully understood. Like I could walk a couple steps, but I was wobbly. I didn't have my balance. On top of this, I was also quite anemic, you know, because when you have all this inflammation, there's collateral damage. So my hemoglobin was really low. My neutrophils that fight off infections were low. Everything was kind of low at that time. I didn't need transfusions, but I was kind of borderline. So I was weak like a newborn, but to walk around, they had to put a belt around my waist and have the physical therapist or my wife hold me so I wouldn't lose my balance. And I used a walker and I had to go home with a wheelchair. And when I went back to the hotel, I say home, I mean the hotel. When I went back to the hotel, I had to get like the elevated toilet seat and a shower chair, cause I couldn't stand How long? It. How long was this process for? So that took a couple weeks for that wow. to get better. It took a long time. Like eventually I went down to walking with walking sticks and you know, gradually got better. I went through physical therapy and trained myself. And, so basically you know, your body went through hell. It went through a right. war. Right. After these T cells were injected, these modified T cells were right. injected was, in you. There was all kinds of collateral damage. Most people don't go through this as bad as right. I did. And they didn't know what was going on. They're kind of, you know, there's a little bit with uh, CAR T therapy is they're building the airplane as they're flying it. It's new stuff. But I got to get to the good part of this. So I went and I had this massive expansion of the T cells and they restaged me. That means they retest to see where I'm at. And I'd had these massively enlarged lymph nodes. And all of them had shrunk except one in normal is 1.5 centimeters at 1.6 centimeters. So that's called a partial emission because it didn't get to 1.5. But a year later, it was still 1.6. And I think it was just scar tissue. It never mm. went back down. But the most impressive thing is I looked in my bone marrow, which had been heavily involved with CLL. 
and they could find no trace of CLL down to one in a hundred thousand or one in a million cells. It just wiped it out. It wiped it out. It also wiped out a lot of my normal cells and other things, but all of those grew back. But 18 months later, when I was rechecked in my peripheral blood, there was no evidence of CLL. How soon after the dosage was administered, how long after that did you get the initial check that gave you- One month. One month. What was that like? What was it like seeing that? So I assume you were also seeing this as a doctor, you were seeing these results. You were looking right. at the numbers, you right. were looking at the at the images in some cases, I right. imagine. Yeah, oh yeah. What was that like for you? So there's two parts. You're anxiously waiting like any patient and it was an unbelievable celebration. You just can't believe it. it's like for the first time in, you know, I've had the disease for 14 years. So this would be about 12 and a half years into it. And we skipped the abrutinib. Yeah, and I want to get to that too. We'll get to that too. That's what we did before that, which is also extremely helpful. Yeah. For the first time in 12 and a half years, I had no detectable CLL. I could have gone. I mean, I couldn't have gone because I had other things. But if you tested me now and you didn't, if I lied on an insurance physical, there would be no evidence that I have leukemia. There's no evidence at all. It's gone. It was an unbelievable celebration for us. We were kind of restricted in terms of what we could do to celebrate, but we went out and had a nice dinner. And, what was you know, that like? What was the dinner it was like? like all un- of you, the six of you? No, well, this is up in Seattle. So it was my wife and I at that point. So we were what just unbelievably dinner? happy. We went out. So I'm vegan, but I ate some fresh- Have you always been vegan? No, since my diagnosis 14 mm. years ago. I figure I got cancer. I don't need heart disease and other stuff. It helps so I, the inflammation for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. But we went out for unbelievable, you know, it's Seattle. So we went out for some incredible salmon, you know, like fresh salmon. It was wow. it was just great. And then we did something that I was nervous about, but we took one of these scenic tours on a seaplane over Seattle. So, you know, the pontoon planes that land on the lake, you know, and take off and toured the Seattle area. So we did that, which was an incredible- Does this mean that when you got tested, you're also your other levels began to become more normal, like your platelets? Yeah, so eventually they normalize as well. Yeah, they took a while to come back up, but they came back up. And if you look at my blood count now, I'm not anemic. My platelets are in the normal range. My other white blood cells are in the normal range. My lymphocytes are ironically low rather than high because I have no B cells and B cells make up the majority because we don't have a marker that's pure enough at this point Hmm. to only attack the CLL. So it also attacks my normal B cells. So I make no antibodies. Like I say, I don't get a flu shot because a flu shot won't work for me because I don't make any antibodies. They were the, I have no, the collateral damage. They were the collateral. So I have to get intravenous immune globulin. I'm dependent on the kindness of strangers. So I get this pooled blood product every six, seven weeks to keep my immune system intact. What was that phone call like to your kids since your kids weren't in Seattle? Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing, we, we set up like a Skype, like a Zoom so call exciting, with everybody. The anticipation you know? to tell oh, them the God, good news. it was unbelievably great because that's why we went up there. And I, I recognize that I'm lucky not everybody can walk away and move to Seattle for two months. I mean, it's a major commitment. Sure. And though it's a clinical trial and things get paid for and I have good health insurance, you're still living in a hotel room for a couple months because we got what we came for. You know, we came up, there was no guarantee. I mean, the trial data was good, but it wasn't like 100% of people were getting this Mm. into complete remissions. So we were unbelievably thrilled and we were on a high and I'm still on that high 18 months later. 18 months ago. 18 months ago. 18 months ago. And when I've talked to the researchers and you know, life doesn't have guarantees, but generally the higher the expansion of the T cells, like we talked about, and the deeper the remission you get, most people don't relapse. Have I hit it out of the park? Is this the home run? Is this like Leonard Cohen says, the card that is so high and wild, I'll never have to deal another. I don't know that it's that, but I'm hoping. I mean, is this potentially curative? It's way too early to say. There are only a handful of patients that are more than five or six years out. But there are a handful of patients that are five or six years out have had no relapse of their CLL. Well, this brings us to something else, which is that, you know, statistics are almost useless in these types of situations, right? I mean, you could look at what the general prognosis is, Um, but that could be totally irrelevant in your case. So when you look at statistics, you have to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. When you're looking at a group of people, and if you're a 65-year-old in the group that they're comparing is an 80-year-old, 
statistics may not apply to you, or if they have certain prognostic markers and you have different ones, you have to make sure of that. And of course, statistics can predict with great certainty what's going to happen to a group of individuals with great certainty. But it's a complete mystery what's going to happen to any individual in that group. And they're also backwards looking. Right. right? It's complete mystery what will happen to any individual because you can't tell who in the group, there's some in the good group, some in the bad group will do well. And all statistics, like you say, are looking backwards. So one of the things I say to patients, never a good time to have CLL, but there's never been a better time to have CLL because the treatments are so much better, except for tomorrow. And the treatments will even be better tomorrow because it keeps getting better all the mm. time. So people who got those kind of deep remissions tend not to relapse. Uh, so that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping in that group, but don't know. Well, you can't, I mean, you can't, we're sitting worry about that, right? Right, I mean, right. That's but I still, important. you know, I get a blood drawn, and again, I worry. Sure, every until time when back. you have to do that, sure. yeah, yeah, and yeah. You know, every time I see the doc and he checks for my lymph nodes sure. and all that stuff. But you know, I'm getting used to being having normal results. I'm getting used to expecting having a low lymphocyte. Brings count. us back to that thing that you said, which is this: you put yourself in a place that you tell the patients that you work with, hmm. which is to underreact, right? And, and now you're kind of getting to a place where. You know, do you want to kind of, you know, be more normal in your reaction now so that you can begin to live a more normal life? And that's the challenge. Right. And I mean, I only get each day once and I try to live it, you know, in a more normal way. I mean, it's not like I'm, even though I have a depressed immune system, I still get on a subway in New York. I still, you know, get on an airplane. I still, you mm. have to live your life. You have to take some risks and do what you have to do to, complete the things that are important to you. So I want to make the best use of our time. I want to touch on the targeted therapies. Sure. And then try and extract the most important things from this and also touch on the advocacy work you're doing, which I think is very important, generally speaking, and also specifically for those people that might be able to benefit from it. So let's talk a little bit about what you did before CAR T cell therapy, which was ibrutinib, which is one of these targeted therapies. So we left out a window there between failing the transplant and getting to CAR-T. And it's all about timing because if I'd been diagnosed with CLL five years earlier, there wouldn't have been any options. I wouldn't be here for this interview. That's absolutely true. And if I diagnosed five years later, I probably never would have had a transplant. I would have just jumped to ibrutinib. So after I was relapsing, there was great controversy about what to do and how to treat the CLL and every center had its own approach. And when every doctor has a different opinion, that means that there's no good way to treat it. There's no diversity of opinion about how to treat a hernia. You know, everybody does hernia surgery. It's not like there's a controversy about it or how to treat a strep throat. Everybody gets penicillin if they're not allergic. But in CLL, there was all this controversy. And suddenly at one of the major meetings in the American Society of Hematology, there was this buzz about this new drug that didn't even have a name. It just had letters, PCI32765. And it was a small molecule. Small molecules means not broken down by the GI tract, so you can take it orally. And it was a targeted- That's a big deal also. That is a big deal for patients. It's a targeted therapy. And again, like any new drug, it was used on the worst of the worst patients. So again, these patients with two legs in the grave were getting this drug. So that's also really important in terms of the conversation we had earlier about statistics, right? right? Because so many of the patients that are getting these experimental therapies are sort of the worst of the worst. Right. So that's where all these drugs start is with the worst of the worst of people who don't have other good options. The implication being that if they're working for those patients, imagine how well they'll work for other people mm -hmm. at an earlier stage. Right. And their immune systems may not be as compromised, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And to be able to move them up, but that's more difficult. And that gets us to a whole other issue that I, maybe we'll have time to talk about, which is equanimity and trials and how do you do that? But what happened here is there was this buzz. So all of a sudden the doctors at Mayo and the doctors at UCSD and the doctors at Ohio State and the doctors at Dana-Farber and MD Anderson were all in agreement. That there was something new happening in the CLL space. And th this never happened before. They were all agreeing. They were all talking about the, a couple new molecules. There was this one, another one called Cal 101, which later became idelalisib. And they were changing the way CLL would be treated. And I said, I got to get me some of that because I relapsed after transplant. Things didn't look good. I was chemo refractory. So I walked in the hall at the American Society of Hematology meeting and introduced myself to John Bird, who was a researcher doing one of these therapies. And I got him to pencil me in for his trial in Ohio State. And I fought to get the insurance to cover it because you know I was going out of state, but there was no trial in California. 
and I jumped into a phase one trial. I am an early adopter, like I said, a phase one trial of this drug. And I picked right. This drug works in a very interesting way. The whole raison d'etre, the whole purpose in life for a B cell is to communicate with other cells and say, oh, I need to form an antibody here. You need me. I need to reproduce and make more antibodies. And it does this through the B cell receptor or BCR. It's sort of like an antenna, you know, on top of the cell. And it gets all these signals from other cells saying, stay alive, proliferate, help us. Well, the problem in CLL is it's chronically turned on. It's very promiscuous. It couples with anybody and everything. And it's always getting this message that you're important, stay alive. It never dies and it keeps that's having babies. That's the malignant component. That's the malignant that's component. The, that's the cellular mitosis component. Right. So what the BTK or Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor did was downstream from this B cell receptor on its way to send a message to the nucleus to stay alive, make more DNA, keep reproduce, make more antibodies. It blocked that, it snipped that off and the B cell lost its purpose in life. It didn't get any messages to stay alive and it lost its homing mechanism that say stay in the protective niches where your homies and the bone marrow and the lymph nodes can protect you and where you can reproduce. And it floated out into the bloodstream, which is easier to kill like shooting fish in a barrel. And they eventually died of loneliness. It wasn't like a rapid kill, but they just kind of died off because they had no reason to stay alive. So they just eventually died. So the PCI32765, which later became ibrutinib and other drugs like it, work very slowly and gently. And what was ironic, and this is an important piece, is when you first take them, your white blood cell count goes up, which people thought, oh my God, the disease is progressing. But the cancer is leaving the lymph nodes, leaving the bone right. marrow, going into the blood. It's changing the compartments. It's disproportionately represented in the bloodstream. Right. So it looks like the cancer is progressing, but eventually it comes down. And that eventually can take two, three years to come down. Now, how visible is the transformation for the lymph nodes? So I'll tell you a personal story on that. So I started on ibrutinib. Two days later, I'm in the shower. And you know, and when you're a cancer patient, you're always saying, what are those? Yeah. And I'm feeling, I say, is it possible after two days, my lymph nodes are getting softer and smaller? And it was two days because later. Because they're dumping these B cells. Yeah, it's dramatic. How soon after this did you get to shave your beard? Pretty quick. I kept, <laughs> I kept a little trim here for a while in case I needed it. So when you see that, there's a portrait of me on the website. I kept that little bit of a thin beard there, but I, you know, eventually got rid of it. You know, I kind of grown attached to it, but mm -hmm. I didn't have to do the big Santa Claus You didn't Claus need beard. it though. I didn't need it. It's it not was, long, yeah. long after you didn't need it. Yeah. So I, I was able to do that. But the most important thing was I went into this deep, deep remission, but my cancer is kind of mutagenic. You know, it tends to mutate around things. So uh, That's and I, generally true, isn't it? Well, some cancers are slower growing than others, but that's why you want kind of orthogonal or right angle kind of treatment. So you kill cancer this way and you kill it that way. So if it mutates around this problem, it can not mutate around a different kind of problem. That's what they're looking at in combination therapies. That's why we use drug cocktails and stuff. But this non-chemotherapy approach that I was this early adopter of is now becoming the standard of care in CLL. In the American Society of Hematology meeting last year, it was compared to the gold standard chemotherapies for people under 65, over 65. In almost every circumstance, it was superior to chemotherapy. So I was lucky in that I chose the right drug, but you know, it's the prepared mind that gets lucky, right? You know, I mean, sure. I'd done my research and I said, this looks exciting, but I got five or six years out of it. And that was long enough, just long enough to where the phase one trials of CAR-T therapy were starting. So when I jumped into the CAR-T trial, I was patient 36. I wasn't one or two where they were figuring out the dose. I was patient 36 and only one patient had died at that point. And they figured out the cytokine release. They knew how to control it. The it's CRS. Not, yeah, the CRS, yeah. So this so, is like 2012 you started this therapy around then? No, so ibrutinib would have been about 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that must have been very exciting. It was incredibly exciting. I was thrilled. And again, there was a thought then for some patients who got ibrutinib front line as their first therapy and hadn't been beaten up like I'd been beaten up with a transplant before. 
some of these patients are still on the ibrutinib seven or eight years later and have not progressed. Hmm. The progression happens because the cancer mutates to work around this pathway shutdown. We don't understand all the reasons that cancer progresses, but we do understand a couple of the most common ones with ibrutinib. So ibrutinib irreversibly bonds to the BTK, and there's a pocket it bonds into, and the cancer cells mutate so it can no longer bind, so it loses its efficacy. That's the most common way. Then one I got, which is less common, which is downstream, there's a gain of function. So I turned a gene on that normally is only turned on if the BTK triggers like dominoes, but my gene learned to turn itself on. So it was a gain of function mutation that I had that turned on the BTK pathway again. So there's so many things. We have a limited amount of time and I wanna make the best use of it. I wanna, before we get into the advocacy component and some other things, I don't know if I mentioned it, but one of the things I've also learned in researching this is that because blood cancers can be easily biopsied, all you need to do is draw the blood, this is sort of in some ways the frontier of some of these targeted or immunotherapies because you can more readily test them. What is the prospect for these types of therapies for other cancers? So important question. And the reality is that blood cancers are the poster child for targeted therapy. So the first targeted therapy was a matinib and CML and Siddhartha Mukherjee won a Pulitzer Prize for writing about the emperor of all maladies, about that kind of thing. And the reason is that if you have breast cancer, we can biopsy it and we can save the specimens, but we can't biopsy it again a month later and three months later. But with blood cancers, I can get blood drawn and a week later have another blood drawn and a month later have another blood. And we can see how things are going and we can look at certain genes or genes being upregulated, downregulated, underexpressed, overexpressed. What's happening? Is the cancer mutating? Is there a second strain? Is there a subclone? That all can be done so we can try all these drugs first. And it turns out that there's a limited repertoire on what the cancers can do. And a lot of these anti-cancer drugs and anti-cancer antibodies also work for solid tumors and other things like that. So the blood cancers are often on the front edge of how we're learning to advance cancer. So it wasn't without reason the American Society of Clinical Oncology, I think it was in 2015, named CLL the cancer of the year. It's almost like being dictator of the year. I mean, what do they mean? But what they're saying is cancer advance of the year. And then last year they named CAR-T therapy as the cancer treatment advance yeah. in a year. So there's a reason because it's easy to do this kind of stuff. It's non-invasive or relatively non-invasive to monitor this and get good data. And every time I get blood drawn, I get an extra six tubes drawn because they're being sent to the hutch or they're being sent to UCSD or and they're being cryopreserved so that somebody can say, hey, I want to see somebody who's at this stage of their cancer with this and this, can I measure this enzyme level? I got a hunch here that there's something going on. So that's what all of us cancer patients do. You can't do that in other cancers to the same extent. So during this entire process, how did your CLL Society come about, which is your nonprofit organization? So when I was stepping away from being a family doc, because I was going for a bone marrow transplant, I was writing emails and stuff. And my kid said to me, dad, that's so old school. You know, nobody reads emails anymore. You know, you need a blog. So I started blogging. And I think of Dr. Kaufman's amazing cancer journey. I can't even remember now. And I was blogging. The blog got really popular for this orphan disease where the average age is 72 years old. There's 22,000 new cases a year. So it's unlike breast cancer where there's more than a you know, quarter million cases sure. or more. It's entirely different kind of numbers. So I started to tell the blog, 20, 30,000 people were reading the blog at a time and following my story. And then when I went into the ibrutinib trial, the PCI 32765, it became even more wildly popular. I was leveraging my background as a family doctor to get interviews with docs. And I was going to all the major conferences and stuff. And I was telling my story, but it became clear after a while that I was telling it in this chronological order. And there was people who were newbies that were jumping in who didn't know what a B cell was, didn't know what the spleen did. And it was somewhere in my blog, but you might have to go back eight months to find when I posted about that. So it seemed like instead of working vertically, I had to work horizontally. So I set up a website for a nonprofit, went through the IRS approvals to get a 501c3 not-for-profit. And we set up this website that looked at things in a horizontal. So we have a basic section for people who don't know the 
beginning of what CLL, what is CLL, how's it diagnosed? What's the complete blood count? We have spreadsheets for people to follow their lab results. We have a glossary of terms. We explain all the acronyms. We have a list of CLL doctors, but we also have an advanced section, you know, where people can learn the latest on CAR T therapy or other things like that. We go to all the major hematology conferences and report from them on the latest research. You're not gonna be able to follow that unless you've gone through the basic and other stuff, but it's all there. It's more searchable, it's more accessible. But we also know that some people don't learn on the web and so we have 30 different support groups across the country in the US so and two in Canada. And that peer to peer relation, there is nothing more powerful than sitting across the table from another CLL patient who's had the disease for 15 years, has been through three clinical trials and it looks great and is doing well. What he can tell you is much more powerful than what another doctor can tell you about the survivorship. So we, we have a whole program that we facilitate and help people with that. That's but incredibly important. It's unbelievably incredibly important, important support groups. Yeah, we're really big on that, but we have standards for them. We have all kinds of rules for how to engage with that because we can't give medical advice. We have to respect confidentiality, but it's been a wonderful thing. And we're constantly growing and training new people for new support groups across the country. We also do 12 educational forums a year at places like the National Institutes of Health or Dana-Farber or Ohio State or Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic. I mean, if it's a CLL place, MD Anderson, Swedish Hospital, I mean, if it's a CLL place, we're training people, we're teaching people about CLL. And unlike other conferences, half our conferences are patients and caregivers talking about their journey. And the other half is hematologists talking about the latest research in CLL. So we do half day conferences, but we also do research. We've presented papers three of the last four years at the American Society of Hematology, done the largest survey ever of CLL patients. We're publishing peer reviewed journals. And this is all with this little non-for-profit with four people. I also want to point out a program that I'm incredibly excited about, which I think is potentially disruptive to medical care if we can get enough support and resources for this. And we're actually publishing research on this at ASH, the American Society of Hematology, and we had a paper that was accepted there. And we know that there's a survival advantage to having an expert on your team if you have CLL. This is so true in rare cancers because the doctors don't have experience treating it. So Mayo did a clinic and showed that there's about a two-year survival advantage just having a CLL expert on your team. But not everybody can do that because they don't have the insurance, they don't have the dollars in the bank. The cost is enormous. Right. I've looked at some of the costs, especially, of course, if you do CAR T-cell. Right, but even not doing therapy, just getting a second opinion. I won't mention the name, but I called a very famous cancer center and I said, I'd like to get a second opinion there. And they said that there's a $20,000 down payment to get the second opinion. This was not to get any therapy, this is to get the bone marrow, CAT scan, BAT scan, all the stuff that they do, lab stuff, 20,000 bucks to walk in the door for them to make a suggestion as to what therapy would be done, hmm. you know? Because- Why is it so expensive? Well, first they all want to do their own stuff. They don't trust well you had a cat There's scan also, done. that brings us also into a question of litigation and liability and right and right. the litigious healthcare system that we have which may be too big of a conversation to have i mentioned it i know this very well uh -huh. because everyone in my family is a physician uh -huh. and i've endured many rants from right. my father or my uncle or my cousin or my aunt about this that or the other thing there's so many well-intentioned regulations that ultimately have very bad unintended consequences as a result. Right. So we recognize that there was this problem or some people just geographically, or they have insurance, they have veterans insurance and it's not a CLL expert or they have Kaiser insurance or whatnot. Nothing wrong with those docs there, but they couldn't get to a CLL expert. So we offer, it's underwritten by pharmaceutical, free consult online, HIPAA compliance, so it's completely confidential. We consolidate their medical records. We go through their electronic medical records. We pro provide a synopsis to a CLL expert at places like Harvard or Ohio State or UCSD or City of Hope. I mean, top, top centers. And the patients get to spend a half an hour FaceTime with a doctor asking their two or three most important questions after the doctors review their medical records. We write up a synopsis and that synopsis goes to their doctor in rural Texas or in Nebraska, where they don't have a CLL expert. And then that doctor has the benefit 
of a consult That's from we Harvard. So these, so these physicians program. are participating pro bono? No, we pay the physicians and we pay the platform that does this, but it's based on a grant that we put together. So it's underwritten by pharma and the donations we get. So it's free to the patients. It's not free to us. Mm. It's our by far our most expensive program. Mm. But we're presenting data on 105 patients that we did this for, but the data is embargoed right now. So I can't share it with you. But let me just say this, that we made differences. We saved lives. Mm. We got tremendous gratitude, not just from the patients, but from the community hematologists who said, oh my God, I didn't realize I'd learned something here. This is the first patient I ever did this for. We are changing lives with this technology. So that's another one of our many programs that we do. So this is a moment here where I think we can offer some really important practical advice, which is how to navigate that line between being an informed patient and being a sort of a burden or disliked by your physician because you're spending a lot of time on Google coming in and presenting him or her with information that may or may not be accurate. It also brings up the challenge of, again, you said something earlier, it had to do with the fact that if you Google online, it can be very dangerous because forget even what information you're going to learn and you're going to give your doctor, you could get incredibly depressed when in fact you shouldn't be at all because what you're looking at is, again, historical data that has no relevance to your outcomes whatsoever. How do you navigate that? What do you tell patients? What do you tell people? Because I guess also people are coming to you after they've already learned about it, but how would you suggest that people proceed to be their own advocate first and walk that line in order to get the help they need in order to make the best decisions possible, knowing again that plenty of physicians don't necessarily know what the latest science is. So becoming your own advocate, I think is critically important. And I have a bias. So when doctors give talks, we have to give disclosures since I got this money from this pharmaceutical company or that money. And my disclosures are my biases, which my bias is towards novel therapies, my bias is towards clinical trials, my bias is towards shared decision-making, and my bias is, is to expert physicians taking care of you. These are my biases that I bring to the table. So how do we get patients to be aware of these kinds of things and advocate for themselves? So for some patients, they can become quite an expert themselves, and we have a ton of stuff to educate, and you have to be sophisticated on the web, but there's sites like ours, clsociety.org, clsociety.org and other sites like the Leukemia Lymphoma Society or the Lymphoma Research Foundation that have very well curated sites, you know, that are physician reviewed and they can get really good quality information on. But for some patients, they don't want to do that. So can they outsource that? And the answer is yes, they can outsource that, but they need to outsource it to someone who knows CLL. Is there a doctor out there who's going to say, I'm inadequate to treat you? Well, there's a few, but most of them you know, this may come as a big surprise, but some doctors have ego issues and they feel like they could treat anything and they don't know what they don't know. So how and do they you- they don't want to say that they can't treat you also. That's right. another thing. Right. Even right. in some cases where they might be familiar with other therapies, they may not tell you about them or send you there because again, ego and there are all sorts of reasons. There's all kinds of reasons, some of which are more nefarious. Yes. Yeah. They're hard to believe actually, but it's unfortunate, but continue please. So how do you pick a CLL doctor? It's tricky because this is an issue that we have. How do we list people as CLL doctors? So we asked a bunch of CLL docs how they recognize a CLL doctor and what essentially they all did was look in the mirror and say, oh, a CLL doctor, and they describe themselves, you know? But what is that description? That description is someone who mostly sees CLL patients, like more than half their practice is CLL patients. So they're not seeing a lot of breast and colon. They're just seeing CLL. Maybe they see some other blood cancers, but mostly it's CLL. And if it's not CLL, it's a related B cell lymphoma that's similar. And they're doing research in CLL. Most, but not all are at academic centers. So that's what you need to do is have one of those people on your team. And if you can't do that, then we can provide that access through our expert access program. Can we just really emphasize how important that is? I don't know that people really understand how big of a difference it is if you have a physician on your team who actually spends time with this particular illness. And this is true across the board, not just for CLL, it's for anything. All right. So if you have appendicitis, you don't want your surgeon to have done one appendectomy in the last year. You want somebody who's doing them all the time. 
And you don't want him to do an appendectomy like he did them 30 years ago when he went through medical school in his residency. You want somebody who's up to date and doing things the, the science way. could have shifted tremendously from yeah. what this person is aware of. Right. So you want somebody who's got experience, who knows the nuances, and there are so many tragedies out there that we see. So the low hanging fruit for us in the CLL world is we have these fabulous treatments that are available now, but so many of the patients aren't getting them. They're not aware of them. They're not aware because they don't know and their doctor doesn't know, or they don't know how to use them, or they're frightened by them. And there's different buckets of CLL, and there are these, we talked a little bit about the prognostic and predictive markers. While they're not absolute, they can be extraordinarily helpful. But we know from real world data that about four to 10 patients is not getting the appropriate testing at times that they need them. So people are getting therapies without being tested to see whether they're appropriate. And even when they're tested and there's markers that say, chemo isn't gonna work for you, we know a significant percentage of patients are still getting chemotherapy. This is the low hanging fruit. These are lives that we can save and we have saved them through our expert access program where a patient was gonna go one way, we gave them this opinion, they took it to their doc, the doc said, good idea, let's do that testing first. <gasps> Thank God we did the testing. I'm going to treat you a different way, you know, because I didn't know that because what I planned wasn't going to work. So we've done that, but I want to reach everybody. That's what we try to do. I mean, we're just, there's four people in our little not-for-profit. I've listed some, not all the things that we do. So we're looking for resources and support to kind of grow what we're doing so we can reach out to more people and make more people aware. That's the low-hanging fruit for us is to, get the people the best care that's available now because that's excellent for a lot of people. Our other big mission is a curative therapy and we don't really have that yet. We're getting close, but we're almost a victim of our own success, Dimitri, because we have drugs that are so good that people are backing away saying, well, I'm going to go after another cancer where the prognosis is- mean researchers. Isn't. Researchers. If you're a young hematologist or oncologist, you want to make a name for yourself, you're not going to go into CLL because- you're not going to make a big name for yourself because it's kind of done, you know, done and dusted. You know, mm -hmm. it's not. You're not going to get federal funding. It's much harder to get funding from people. It's much harder to advance your career. And the pharmaceutical companies are saying, you know, when I've got a drug that has a 90% response rate and I've got to beat it, it's going to be hard for me to get my drug to fact, market. What about the fact that this is, again, the poster child for some of these advanced therapies. Isn't there a case to be made that this is the best place to experiment? The case to be made is that blood cancers are the best place exactly, to experiment. Exactly. But it may not be CLL. Right, it might okay. be a different blood cancer where the prognosis is worse. Mm, so it's still a lot going on and there's still stuff going on in CLL, but there's less. So that's our second goal. That's a much bigger goal is we want to encourage young hematologists to dedicate their career. So we have an, the people that brought us all these breakthroughs made their career in CLL, but we want to make sure there's a new generation. How do you do that? You support their research, you fund their research. So you give them a dedicated day or two a week in their postdoc time to say, I want you to research. You get competitions together and say, give us four or five research proposals and we'll fund you for three years of research and you get outside people to judge which is the best research. This is not so happening is a, so much in CLL. So, this is, so there's a grant writing arm to your organization. So there's yeah, a big, we're very, big, part, big part of this is about raising funds. You bet. It's not just for me, it's for any not-for-profit, any 501c3, because there's so much more we can be doing. I mean, like I say, the low-hanging fruit is getting everybody the best possible care, but the other thing is to find a curative care. And the research money is starting to dry up in CLL, and we want to be able to fund that, but that's a big budget item to fund research. But we have a really strong medical advisory board. And our thought is the best bang for our buck is going to be getting young fellows, young researchers, giving them a grant, try to get their institutions to match that grant, give them three years, pick what we hope are going to be winter projects to move forward on this so we can develop stuff. I mean, that's the kind of thing that we think we can do that within our reach with just a little more grant funding. So how do people get involved to help? 
how can people donate to your organization? How can they participate in this process to try and tackle that second component, which is finding a permanent cure for CLL? Well, thanks for asking that question, Demetri. I appreciate that. So the easiest way is to go to clsociety.org. And we have a donate button right there and there's all different kinds of ways. And if people want to, they can actually reach out to me. I'm very accessible. I'm all over the web. B for Brian Kaufman, K-O-F-F-M-A-N at clsociety.org. B Kaufman at clsociety.org. They can email me. I can have a discussion with them. I can help them with that. But we're pretty accessible. We're pretty out there in the community, but that would be the best way to reach out. Would just go to the website or if they have particular questions or want to look at us in different ways or have a conversation with me, it would be great if they could just email me, bkaufman at clsociety.org. And that would be another way to do this because we're leaving patients behind that aren't getting the care that they need. And it's getting harder and harder to do more and more of the research we need. I'm not saying we're the only ones there, National Institutes of Health and other people are still doing it. And we need to push for more of these therapies, more with the CAR-T, more other things. We need to find ways to get these things paid for. There's a lot of issues that we're involved with. Well, the person that put us in touch, he knows another individual whose father apparently you mm -hmm. saved. And I mean, I can't say enough about this low-hanging fruit that you, you call yeah. low-hanging fruit. I think it's hard for people to understand just how big of a deal it is to be educated because I think people have this expectation that somehow there's this sort of uniform medical establishment and that the information is just there. And I know from my own personal experience, you know, having gone through a brain tumor diagnosis and seeing literally doctors within walking distance in some cases of one another at Columbia, at Mount Sinai, at Cornell, and getting completely different diagnoses to the point where the outcomes would have been totally orthogonal. Yeah. And in one specific case, in the case of Columbia, this physician, I think, was very well aware of what was happening down in Cornell, but for whatever reason, didn't bring There's it to our attention. And that is a remarkable thing. So I, I want to say there's reason for hope. There's so much reason for hope, not just generally speaking in terms of what's happening and the advances that I'm aware of, that you're so much more aware of than I am, but just in education. And I think overcoming the fear and engaging with the material, and I think you guys have really made that much easier with your organization on the website. I did some of that just preparing for this conversation. And I know that if you're a patient, it's scary, it's daunting to engage with that. But I think if you are a patient or if you're anyone that, you know, if you've got loved ones that are going through something like this, it's so important to engage with the material. And I think that fear begins to melt as you confront it. So let me respond to that in a couple of ways. The first is your experience, which I think is a very common experience in CLL. One of my mottos that I say to patients, I have different commandments that I teach patients in dealing with this is one, that you're gonna to have to make life-changing decisions with incomplete knowledge and conflicting advice. Life-changing decisions with incomplete knowledge and conflicting advice. There is absolutely no question because if it's easy to treat, then it's easy to treat and everybody does the same thing. But it's not that way with a lot of brain tumors and it's not that way in CLL. So that's one thing I wanna say. The other I would say is there's a lot of patients who come to their very first session in one of our support groups and have that sort of deer in the headlights look and you're using language and they don't know what a lymphocyte is and you know people are saying- And even those words are super scary. Each yeah, one of those words is scary. Right, and there's all <laughs> this medical ease and there's the experienced patients who are doing this. And I will tell you, it kind of washes over you and you can get better with that. But you can also outsource this. You can outsource this to an adult child. You can outsource this to a spouse or you can outsource it to a CLL expert. If you have an expert who's doing this, you don't have to be a world expert yourself. And a lot of people don't want to be and that's okay. But if you're not the expert, then you better have an expert on your team. You've got to do that because that's where the survival advantage is. I think you need to be engaged with your own therapy. And there's ways to do that. And, you know, we do a little teaching around that too. You want to be the most precious commodity for all of us is time. And especially for docs, they don't have time. So that's another what, tough thing. That's yeah. a very difficult thing because as a patient, you want all the time in the world with your right. doctor. 
And not just because you want to learn more, but because you want that emotional assurance that they care. Right. And it's hard to deal with. The, and of course, the physician has to have some healthy emotional distance from the patient. Right. So when you present, one of the things that bugs me as a family doc is people will bring up the most important thing last. They're afraid. You know, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I spend all this time on looking at their toenail. And as I'm walking out the door, they say that crushing pain I get in the center of my chest when I climb the stairs, that's nothing. Is it They dog. know it's important. They yeah. just, they're afraid they're, to say They're afraid it. to. So don't do that if you're a cancer patient. Bring up the most important thing. It's unlikely the doctor is going to get to all five of your questions. So make sure you ask your one and two first, you know, that you get those in. Be concise, be factual. You know, these are kinds of things you can do. And don't be afraid to be assertive if something's important to you. I also recommend bringing a recorder, you know, bring your phone in, turn it on record. If your doctor doesn't want to be recorded, get a different doctor. Because my wife and I have walked out of consults and had completely different opinions mm. of what's going on. Different have some, recollections of what was said, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Because you so want to hear learn. a certain thing. I mean, right. your, your cognitive bias is so strong when right. you're going into a meeting with a physician in such circumstances. So record it, bring your significant other with you to these meetings. I, like I say, this is a family journey. I couldn't have done this without my wife and she listens and hears things that I don't hear. And I'm listening differently because I'm a doc, you know? So it's critical. These are all practical tips in terms of what you can do to get the most out of those doctor's appointments. But, you know, becoming educated, our motto is smart patients get smart care. That's our mm -hmm. motto. And, you know, that's what we try to promote. I want to emphasize something you said about you're making life-changing decisions with incomplete knowledge. I think for many people, it's a shocking experience because particularly for risk-averse people, I think it's interesting you say you're um, an early adopter. I think that's to your advantage in these types of situations because you really are thrust into a circumstance that for many people is completely undesirable. I mean, certainly the cancer itself is undesirable. But a circumstance of making these types of life-changing decisions with incomplete information, and it's something that you really have to embrace. And I think in my own experience, what helped me through this was embracing it and sort of finding value in the journey, realizing that there is value in courage. And there's something to that. That, And this also, you, you said you're Jewish, you're a practicing Jew. Yeah. So you're religious in some sense. And I think that it helps to have some sort of engagement with the mystery, you know, right. and not just, you know, seeing yourself as a sack of cells or whatever else. Dr. Kaufman, there's so much more we could talk about. We have, this is probably the longest episode I've ever done. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And so we have to wrap it up. I appreciate you coming on. I mean, I want to give you the floor to, to sort of end it with whatever you want to say. I mean, we gave the website out what else would you like to say to our listeners? Well, first, I want to thank you for the opportunity to do this. And I, I think what we do is a model for what can be done in other disease states, other cancers. And uh, we're anxious to grow and be able to reach the people that we're not reaching now. We're anxious to get the next generation of researchers out there and fund them. So we are looking for help, you know, people who can help us fundraise or people who can directly donate to us and through the clsociety.org. We're looking for that kind of help because what we do is going to make a difference. Some of the research in CLL is already starting to be look like it's going to be helpful in lung cancer, breast cancer, or other things like that. So we know that we can make a huge difference beyond what we're doing, but we're also modeling different ways of being. And this has all been essentially done from our kitchen table with a couple of people. Now we've expanded, we've got four people, and, but we're looking to grow this and make it bigger, make it sustainable, and we need outside help to do that. So if there's ways of people know to help us in terms of developing resources, fundraising, or that they can write us a check, we'd be extraordinarily grateful for that. You gave a lecture at some event in Ireland yeah. not long ago. Yeah. I watched a great lecture. Well, I recommend for anyone that's either dealing with CLL specifically or looking for a really hopeful presentation, an honest but hopeful presentation, and also a moving presentation because that's the one where your wife narrated this beautiful comic that your son put together. Again, CLL 
CLSociety.org. Is that the- That's right, CLSociety.org, all one word. Yeah, CLSociety.org. And if they want to donate, they can do that on the homepage. There's a donate button there. Right, right at the top of the page, yeah. And I've put a link to that website in the description to this week's episode. I've let you all know that there is no overtime to this week's episode because I wanted to give as much of this information out as possible. There is, of course, a transcript available to subscribers as well as the rundown and an afterthought segment that I'm going to do after Dr. Kaufman leaves today in place of the overtime. And you can find all of that at patreon.com slash hidden forces. There's a link to the Patreon in this description. But if it's an issue and you can't afford the subscription for whatever reason, given the nature of this material, email me. I don't know when I can get back to you because I get a lot of emails and I hope not to miss it, but if I see the email and if I don't see it, email me again and I'll get you a transcript and a copy of the rundown so you don't have to pay for it. And again, Dr. Kaufman, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. It's been great talking with you. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>